want a warm welcome, of, uh, a big hand for Dr. Daniel Ganser. Thank you, George. So first, I want to thank uh, George for the invitation to come to Amsterdam, and I, I want to thank you that you, you come to my lecture. It's very nice to be here. I'm from Switzerland, um, so my native language is uh, Swiss German. I hope so, but I, it, we decided we'll do this uh, uh, conference in English because it's uh, probably the language that most people can relate to. And I was in Amsterdam 23 years ago. I was a student, I was 23 years old, and I was at uh, Plantage Moedegracht, if that is the correct pronunciation. And I just have very strong feelings about Amsterdam. So when I come back, uh, I go like, oh, yes, I remember this plane, and I know this street, and here escape with a party. And, and uh, so this morning, I went to this plantage to check whether the student house is still there, and it's still there. So it was a very good start for the day today. Um, I will speak about difficult topics. I will speak about terrorism. I will speak about wars. And uh, what I do is, in Switzerland, I research uh, the question, why do we go into wars? I mean, what's happening? Why are we doing it again and again and again? Although we know as a human family, it's not a good idea. And uh, so I specialize into uh, war propaganda. How do you get um, a country to attack another country? And uh, I think it's very interesting what, what you find out about war propaganda. And I want to talk about this today. And I will also talk about 9-11. And I've been researching the issue for many, many years. And I know it's a delicate uh, issue and it's a an issue that some people don't want to touch, but I think it's a good idea that we talk about it here today. Can you understand me okay? Is it okay? Okay. I have a few topics, and um, being, I've been you know, teaching students for a long time. Now I'm outside of university because if you research these things. But you can always see where we are. I want to start with uh, point number one. There are today uh, 1093 countries um, in the world, and there is a law which says that one country should not invade another country. Okay? So we can have a stable 21st century if we would adhere to that law. It just means that if you have a, if you have a tank, you're not allowed to, to cross the border and, and occupy another country. If you have an airplane, you're not allowed to fly into the airspace of another country and drop bombs. That's illegal. And you cannot actually um, take a small group and give them money and weapon and training in another country to overthrow the government, that secret warfare, and it's illegal. And this law was introduced um, in 1945 at the end of the Second World War. It was the first time in human history when we said war is illegal. This is something very crucial to realize because when human beings think about the Second World War, they think it was all bad, okay? And it was very bad, okay? There was a lot of suffering. And um, the one thing which I think which is good about World War II is that at the end, people said, we should make wars illegal. That was the only good thing about World War II. And I think students should be told um, when they go to school that that is the only thing which is good, uh, which came out of World War II. The United Nations Charter was signed in 1945. 60 million people were killed. And people came together and said, this is madness. You know, you just maybe remember the atomic bombs were dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and people looked in each other's eyes, the cities were destroyed, and they go like, what, what madness? And then they signed the charter, and it says in Article 2.4, all members, which means all members of the United Nations, which is every single country in the world, shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state, or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. So it really means all members shall refrain from the threat or use of force. Or if you make it shorter, all members shall refrain from the use of force. That's what it really means. And Obviously, um, uh, Holland is a member of the United Nations, Switzerland is a member of the United Nations, US, Russia, China, Nigeria, all these countries are members of the United Nations. So my students have asked me, but if that is the law, I mean, why do we still have wars? Because wars are illegal. And then I say, 
because people forget about it. Okay, people forget about what we've known after the Second World War, that we shouldn't kill each other. So they forget, and they get all stirred up, and they run into the next war, and when people say, oh, you know, we shouldn't do that, and they say, that's very un un unpatriotic, you know, if you don't participate in the war. Uh, so this is really um, a very, very important um, point of reference for the peace movement. I just, you know, collectively label you the peace movement as people who are against wars and war propaganda. And the peace movement should think, okay, that we have these wars and that they are illegal. And somebody has told me, well, if the charter says the wars are illegal and it doesn't work, then the UN, you know, we should kick it out of the window because it doesn't work. And I say, no, 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 that's not a good idea. The better idea is to go back to the charter and stick to what it says, okay? Um, and now, obviously, this is a this is very, very topical issue. We have... We have um, tensions in, in the Gulf of Oman, in the, in, in, in the, in the zone between the United States and uh, Iran. Now, these tensions are real. We know that they are for real. But if we think of the UN Charter, then we know that it is illegal that the United States bombs Iran tomorrow. It's illegal. They're not allowed to do it. And it would also be illegal for Iran to bomb the United States tomorrow. Do you see that? So the rule is for both countries. One country is not allowed to bomb the other country. And this is on 13th June, um, uh, and the Americans have then said, you know, Iran is to blame for the damage done to this ship. And then the Iranians said, no, we didn't do it. And maybe you've heard that just a few days ago, um, a drone was shot down by Iran. And that, that's a fact. And then the Americans said, this drone entered, was, was outside of Iranian airspace. And the Iranians have said, no, it was inside Iranian airspace, and we will probably never find out. But, you know, both sides should stick to the Charter of the United Nations, and they should de-escalate, okay? They should de-escalate. This is where it took place in the Gulf of Oman, just if you don't have the map in front of you. That's where a tanker uh, has, 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 you know, has had little damage, basically, and the drone was shut down. That was just the last days. I'm not sure whether, you're fo whether you still have television or you read newspapers. I mean, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> how many people don't have any television anymore here in the audience? Oh, that's more and more people. It's actually a very good idea. <laughs> With my wife, we have kids, they're 10 and 13, so the kids are not allowed to watch television. I always tell them that's not good for you. And, and then my wife says, you in your talks always say that television is full of propaganda. And I say, yes. And then she says, well, we could give it away. And I say, no, we can't because of Champions League. I mean, I really, <laughs> I really watched these games when Ajax won against Real Madrid. I loved it. And so that's why I don't give away uh, the television. But I think it's very... Um, it's not very wise to use television as a, as a tool to learn about the world, okay? It's usually a lot of propaganda in television. So U.S. Uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said, Iran is to blame, and Iran says, We're, we didn't do that. And then, you know, as historians, and I'm, I'm a trained historian, my PhD is in history, we look at the date and we go, okay, are these damages done by mines? And then the question is, why did they put the mines above sea level? Do you understand the question? <laughs> this is a very obvious question if you're, if you're into military affairs. Some, some might maybe remember in 1985, the French Secret Service, uh, Direction Générale Sécurité Extérieure, DGC, they blew up a ship, Rainbow Warrior, from the Greenpeace. Do you? It's a long time ago. <laughs> but what they did, that, I, I was interested in that story, because what they did is they, they went to Auckland in New Zealand, and Greenpeace had their Rainbow Warrior ship in the harbour. Of, of Auckland, because with that ship, they would go out into the Pacific and protest against the French nuclear testing. So they would always go with their ship exactly where the French wanted to blow up their nuclear bombs and say, you can't do that, which I think is a very good idea to do that. I'm a friend of Greenpeace. So then they had the ship in the harbor of Auckland, and the French president, Mitterrand, said, il faut faire quelque chose, which means we have to do something. And then the job was given to the military secret service, which is DGSE, which is the French CIA. And they went to Auckland with agents. And these agents, in the night, had um, swimming divers who went to the ship and they put mines on the ship, OK? They put two mines. One mine was to wake everybody up in the, sh in the ship, so it's like an alarm clock. 
and so they wouldn't die. So they went all out of the ship. And the second mine was to sink the ship. And if you look at the history, it's very clear that they put the mine in the water. Do you see that? So when I saw this, I go, what sort of attack is that? You put, you put the mine above the sea level. But there was no debate about it. There was no debate. And then we, we took the data from the shipping company. The ship is called Courageous. We changed Courage, okay? And Kuka Courageous, and that is owned by the Japanese. And then the Japanese, on that ship, they had a crew, but they're all Philippines. And the Filipinos said, we saw something through the air coming. It was not a mine. So now we don't know what happened. We just don't know. It, maybe it was a drone attack. We don't know. But independent of, of what is happening, it just means we should, as a human family, stick to the UN Charter and not start bombing a country when we don't actually know what's, what, what's going on. Because that is what happens all the time, you know. People have no clue what is happening. Then they have an opinion without having a clue. Then they start a war and they bomb a country where they don't know anybody and they hate people they don't know. And that's happening again and again and again, okay? And it's my job as a historian to point things out and say, okay, maybe that's not a good idea. <laughs> because we travel a lot, right? All of us travel a lot. And if you, if, you, if you visit another country and you come back home, you usually don't think, that's one country we sh that should be bombed, right? <laughs> usually we don't think that, right? I mean, you travel a lot. I know that sometimes we like a country more and another country we don't like it that much. But it often has to do with food, okay? <laughs> it, really, it really is a little bit like that. You like the food, you like the country. <laughs> or if you meet people in the country and you have good exchange, good thoughts, you're all relaxed. And that's interesting when you know and you've traveled the country and some, you read about the media that we should bomb this country. Well, but you've been there. Then you go, no, that's not a good idea. But very often we talk about countries that nobody of us have ever been, like Afghanistan or Pakistan. People go, there's no club met there, I don't go there. So then they bomb these countries based on stories which we don't understand. So Antonio Guterres, who is the UN Secretary General, and he of course knows the UN Charter, says the world doesn't need another war, and that's, that's certainly correct. So that's my first point, that the UN Charter pro prohibits wars. Now, I want to give you a specific um, example. When China invaded Tibet, according to my analysis, that's illegal. Okay. Because it, the invasion happened in 1950, and what you then have to do, if you do an analysis, you have to check, is 1950 after 1945? That's the first step. Because the charter was, was signed in 45, so everything that happens after 45 is based on that new law. You can't take a conflict from 1822 because the charter was not active then. But, you know, there's general consensus that 1950 was after 1945. That, so the charter applies. Then the second thing that you have to check are these two different countries. Is China and Tibet, are these two different countries? That's a really tricky question. Because if I gave this talk now in China, they would say Tibet is not an independent nation. It has always been part of China. And in fact, I have friends, you know, they, they know a lot about Chinese history and they say, yeah, you can argue this and they're obviously Chinese historians who have a different perspective than I have. But my perspective is it's illegal. You can't do it, it's an independent country. The Tibetans, they didn't have um, an army. Um, so they, um, they may protest and in 59, so after nine years of occupation, the Dalai Lama left Tibet and I'm always saying, if, if the Chinese on the Mao, Mao is obviously the leader of, 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 of the Chinese at that time, if the Chinese had not invaded Tibet, if they had respected the UN Charter, that would have been much better. Okay. So that's the ex example of uh, Tibet. Let's take another example. Winston Churchill is well known, um, um, British Prime Minister after, after the Second World War and during World War II, obviously, he was very uh, strongly involved in British war efforts. Now, the British overthrow the government in, in Iran. And I always, you know, take a world map and, and I, I put this long dash here to make sure that's not the same country. <laughs> it's not the same country. So, the UN Charter says we should not use force in international relations. Now, if you go to another country and you overthrow the government, that is illegal. It is just illegal. I can, it is not, you know, it's not a huge debate like, 
is it totally illegal or can you like do it once or twice in 10 years and people would sort of accept that? And No, it's always illegal. You cannot do it. Had the Iranians overthrown the British government in 1953, there would have been huge protests at the United Nations. So, it was not the British army, okay, that invaded Iran and overthrew the government, but it was the Secret Service, is what MI6. Um, and the MI6 called up the CIA, which is the American Secret Service, and they said, can we do it together? And they said, okay, let's do it together. But the problem is, when, when you think of the coup today, um, most people don't remember that the Iranian uh, prime minister at the time was called Mohammed Mossadegh. He was overthrown, but people don't know his name. So that is the power of history, okay? You can erase things that you don't like. You just erase them. And how does it work? You don't talk about them. That's how you erase it. And then you can reframe it. And the reframing is very, very powerful. So in Switzerland, I think it's the same here in the Netherlands, when people mention the word MI6, they don't think of the overthrow of Mossadegh in 1953 and that this was a violation of the UN Charter, but they think of James Bond. Do you see that? That is a total reframing, total and successful. <laughs> I mean, MI6, MI6 is the secret service of the British. And I just give an example how a norm this is more for men, maybe not for women. But for men, the, when the, a normal Swiss guy, I can't talk about the Dutch, but I just talk about the normal Swiss guy. He sits at home and he watches a movie, a James Bond movie. He has his beer here and he has the chips here. He's maybe tired from work and he say, now I want to relax. I want to have a nice evening. So what does he see? He sees 20 people with machine guns shooting at James Bond. And I have to keep in mind, a machine gun fires several bullets per second, not per minute, per second. And then you can think, if 20 guys fire several shots per second, is that a problem? And then you see, it's not a problem for James, okay? <laughs> Never. Used to be the communists, then it was the Muslims. Have you seen the change? Next thing that you see is that James Bond runs away. He always has to run, he's always in a, in a hurry. And then he jumps into th this old helicopter. And obviously, if you look at a helicopter objectively, you will realize there's a lot of switches and a lot of instruments. and very difficult to start a helicopter that you don't know. Now, James jumps in it, and he just starts it right away. And that is amazing, right? He doesn't need the user manual and the half an hour training. And then that's, you know, your, your normal guy goes like, yeah, James, uh, he knows, how to, he, he can actually fly every airplane, every helicopter, he doesn't, in, independent when it was built. And then the next thing is he comes into a fight with a strong guy, uh, and you think, okay, that's maybe tricky, but in the end he wins again, and then he charged, starts with a jet, okay, very tricky also, and then he goes with a car very fast, much faster than anybody else, and everybody crashes and he just goes away. And at the end, he, he, he sort of walks into a room and there is a beautiful woman waiting for him. And that's the moment where the average Swiss takes a zip from the beer and says, James is a little bit like me. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and that is, obviously, obviously men are, are realistic. They say, if I had more time for my training and, you know, <laughs> I always wanted to get a license for a helicopter, but my wife said it's too expensive and now I have a, a lawnmower. But the thing is... <laughs> No, but the thing is that the, the identification is with MI6. Do you see that? It's in the brain. It's in the brain, and we're even paying for it. So when we hear MI6, we don't think of the UN Charter. We think of James Bond. But then you take Daniel Craig or anybody else and look at them, and you see the fact is they are actors. They are actors. If you put them in a real situation with 20 guys with machine guns, and they fire, then Daniel Craig would just die. And Roger Moore too. <laughs> so we really need to come back and, and distinguish between facts and fiction. Because we're all caught up in fiction. And, and Mossadegh was overthrown. The Americans 
you know, excuse themselves, but only in the year 2000, so almost a half year, uh, 50 years later. The Eisenhower administration believed its actions were justified for strategic reasons, but the coup was clearly a setback for Iranians' political development, and it's easy to see now why many Iranians continue to resent this intervention by America in their internal affairs. That's uh, Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State. And so it's like 50 years later when they say sorry. That's when they say sorry. But in Switzerland, and I think the same in, in, in the Netherlands, is we've always heard the American perspective, and we have very seldom heard the Iranian perspective. But the UN Charter, just to repeat this, makes this illegal. It's not that, you know, the Eisenhower administration can decide for strategic reasons to intervene and then it's okay. <laughs> you know, no country has the right to do it. And then the question is, what is the strategic reason? And the strategic reason was that the Iranian nationalized the oil, okay? They nationalized the oil, British Petroleum, they nationalized it, and so the British and the American were losing money. That's all. It's about money. And then the question is, if it's illegal, were then the British punished? And the answer is no, because the United Nations has a very good charter. The charter says we can't have wars. But you have five members in the Security Council, that's US, that's Russia, that's China, that's France, and that's Great Britain. I have to change that picture soon, but right now it's okay. <laughs> and these five are the winners of the Second World War. So these five are so-called veto powers. And if they attack another country, they're not punished. It's very important to understand this, okay? The UN Charter says you can't do it, but if you're a member of the Security Council, you can do it. That's crazy. People tell me, isn't that unfair? And I say, oh yeah, that's bloody unfair. That's as, as unfair as it gets. And then I say, can we not change it? Then I say, we can only change it if the Security Council is in agreement, okay? The veto powers, if they bomb a country, there will not be a meeting of the Security Council which says, well, you've just overthrown the government in Iran, now you get sanctions. It's not happening because the British would then put their veto. Let's take Dwight Eisenhower. Here he invades Cuba. I've again made a map and shown with this red arrow, this, this is not the same country. So if it's not the same country, then it's international relations. That's what international relation means, okay? It's always the relations between two states. And here's one state is US, and the other state is Cuba. So clearly, the Americans have no right to intervene in Cuba and overthrow the government, but that's what they decided. Eisenhower, at the time president, um, he decided on 17 March 1960 um, that the CIA should recruit and train Cubans in exile here in Florida. They flew them to Guatemala, trained them, and then they made an invasion. Now, that is obviously and blatantly illegal. You can't do it. And then somebody said, but yeah, but Fidel Castro is a communist. And then I said, that doesn't matter, okay? It doesn't say all nations shall refrain in their international relations from the use of force unless there is a communist, okay? It doesn't say that. So here's Fidel, and um, Eisenhower wanted to overthrow him. It was the idea of the CIA that it would be successful, okay? Because they had over already overthrown Mossadegh. They thought, we can do this with Fidel as well. It's just a small country. And um, then Eisenhower stepped down as president, and in March, nine, uh, in January 1961, JFK came to power. Now, when JFK came into the White House, he was informed by Alan Dulles, who, the, who at the time was the director of the CIA, that they had this small little army waiting to make an invasion. <laughs> that's that's going to be a funny day when you become president and they inform you of all the secret projects they have. And obviously, Kennedy, as the commander-in-chief, could have said, no, we're not going to do that. You could say that. You could, if you're if president, you can say, we're not going to do that. But Kennedy was new. He was new on the job, his first day in the White House. So, so he said, okay, we can try, which is illegal, right? He said, we can try, and all the people from the CIA told him, this will work, it will be, it, this will be total success. We're going to just kick Fidel Castro's ass, and he'll, he'll just be out of the window, don't worry. And then the invasion came, and it was a failure. Okay, it was a failure. 
And then Kennedy, and I looked at this in, in great detail, he had aircraft carriers in the area, and he could have ordered the aircraft carriers to intervene, because the CIA had messed it up, and overthrow Castro. He didn't do that. So what I want to explain is Kennedy went with the CIA a certain, a certain, a certain distance, and then when it failed, he stopped it. He stopped the invasion. It was very, very seldom. And then he fired Alan Dulles, who was the director of the CIA. He fired him right away. He said, I'm going to tear the CIA into a thousand pieces. And then in 63, that's two years later, Kennedy was shot from different angles by one person. <laughs> but let's go back to 61. Let's go back to 61. In 61, the CIA said, if we want to invade Cuba, we first have to destroy the Air Force. So if you want to invade a country and it's an island, you have to destroy the Air Force because you always have to come with ships. And if you come with ships and the other one has an Air Force, he will sink your ships. Very easy. So they, they had U-2 planes, U-2, not the band, um, the planes. And these planes can fly very, very high. And they monitored Cuba and they saw, okay, Fidel Castro has a very, very small air force, only 10 planes. <laughs> so they decided, we're going to destroy these planes. So the CIA said, we're going to use B-26 B bombers, and we're going to destroy the air force of Fidel Castro. Now, the problem is, if you bomb another country, that makes it very, very obvious that you violate the UN Charter. So the CIA painted the planes in different colors. This is the Cuban flag. And they painted F-A-R on the plane, which means Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias, which is Spanish and means Cuban Air Force. <laughs> so they just put the wrong name on the plane. And people go, like, no, is, that, is, is it really that simple? And I say, yes, it's that simple. They put the wrong color on the plane. And then when Fidel Castro shot down the plane, he saw, oh, that's actually the, the flag of my country, and that's actually the name of my military. Isn't that funny? I mean, you shoot something down, and you say they're invading, and when you shoot it down, you see, oh, they put down my name on it. And we call that false flag. Okay? An operation under a false flag is when you... Usually it was with the ships. You, you attack, think that you're a very, very evil pirate of the Caribbean, you're not Johnny Depp, but you want to attack another ship, right? So if you come with your ship and on your flag you see pirate flag, the other ones will, will shoot at you. It's very bad for you. So what people then did in old ages, they put the wrong flag up, and only at the last second they put the real flag. But then it was too short. Then they entered the other ship, took all the gold, killed everybody. That was the game. And this is being used in military affairs. It's called false flag operation. You put up a sign, and people think, oh, that's the truth. But it's not the truth. And in the United Nations, Cuban ambassador Raul Roa went to the Security Council on the 15th of April, 1961. And as historians, we, did, we, we reread the Security Council protocols. Nobody does that. Well, we do it. And then he says, Cuba is now being bombed by the United States. This is a violation of the United Charter. He says that, right? And then the American ambassador, Stevenson, says, the U.S. has nothing to do with this. And then, that's a funny moment. The U.S. ambassador says, these are Cuban pilots who are so disgusted with the dictatorship of Fidel Castro that they decided to leave the country. But before leaving their country, they have bombed their own country. <coughs> do you see the story? And he presents the pictures with the planes, where you can see there's Cuban flags on it. So he says, this is the proof, okay? This is the proof. Cuban planes bomb their own country. <laughs> and like that, obviously, the United Nations cannot work, okay? If you have a lot of lies in international politics, you have a lot of suffering, that's all. That's like in a family. If everybody lies to each other, nothing works. It doesn't work. And when I research these things, and I, you know, have a marker and have a pencil, and then I go, incredible, and this is interesting, and he really says that, and then, I, then as a student, you know, you research these things, you say, this is impossible, nobody believed it, but people believe it. 
So you can take it like that, that people believe a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Presidents tell stories, ambassador tells stories. It's all, even if it's total nonsense, people say, it must be true, he said it. I'm like, why do people believe all that stuff? And the charter, just to remind you, says, all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force. So it's not okay if the CIA bombs Cuba. And this, these things can get very, very dangerous because then the Soviet Union sent nuclear missiles to Cuba, and the, the threat was in 1962 that America and the USSR would come into direct confrontation and that you have a nuclear third world war, okay? So this is always like, people go like, ah, oh, doesn't matter. And I go like, do you want a nuclear confrontation? Do you want that? And the, the risk was there because the, the Americans saw that the Soviets put their nuclear missiles in Cuba. And I went through the records, and it was one very funny when Kennedy said he had everything recorded in the White House. And then he, at one point he says, well, that's really crazy what Khrushchev is doing. That, Khrushchev is the predecessor of Putin, if you want. And it's really crazy what, what Khrushchev is doing. He's putting nuclear missiles into Cuba. That's as if I put nuclear missiles into Turkey. <laughs> and then the national security advisor of, of Kennedy says, well, Mr. President, that's what we did. <laughs> <laughs> because in 59, the Americans had put nuclear missiles into Turkey and Italy. There was no Turkey crisis, but you know, it's, it's the, the way we see things depends on the level of information that we have. And I remember then when, when I was a student, I read all these American books, and they said, well, the Soviets are cr really crazy, okay? They put nuclear missiles into Cuba. I mean, that is crazy. And I'm like, yeah, that's really crazy stupid Soviets, I mean, why did they do that? <laughs> and then I read other books, and then I say, but the year before, the CIA tried to overthrow the government. I'm like, oh, the other book didn't say that. That's, that, that's something that, that changes my picture. I should maybe read more books about these things. And then I read a third book, and I go, and the Americans put nuclear missiles into Turkey. I'm like, gee, wait a moment, they didn't say that in the other book. So it always depends on the level of information that you have in international relations. Because usually they don't lie to you, they just cut one bit away, okay? That's the main trick, cut one bit away. So we've done uh, Tibet, we've done Iran, we've done Cuba, let's do Vietnam. Um, Johnson came into power when Kennedy was killed in Dallas, okay? Kennedy was shot. He was shot and he died right there. Then Vice President Johnson came into power. Because if you shoot the president, the vice president becomes president, that's, that's the rule. And Johnson escalated the war in Vietnam, whereas Kennedy wanted to withdraw all troops from Vietnam. So the, the, the shooting of Kennedy really helped to escalate the war in Vietnam. And I, I, I painted here this arrow to just make it crystal clear that Vietnam is far away. That's the whole story. And then you have to ask yourself, how come can the US bomb Vietnam? How, how can it be done? And this is a, a, a quote. Oh, this, this is too much. It's just one is enough. My fellow Americans, as President Commander-in-Chief, it is my duty to uh, the American people to report that renewed hostile actions against United States ships in the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. That's what Johnson said on August 4, 1964. So he says this, and people hear it in the United States, and they don't know where the Gulf of Tonkin is, right? They have no clue. They think it might be in Africa. And then they, they go like, oh, gee, we have been attacked. Okay? Do you see that? They have that feeling. The others started a war, and we just have to defend ourselves. And the, the, the journalist, you know, it would be the role of the journalist to question power, okay? When a president invades another country, the journalist should ask, why do you do that? And... They are far away, and we shouldn't bomb other countries, and don't you know the UN Charter, and all these questions. That's what journalism is about. They should do that, and there are still some journalists who do it, but not many. Uh, and they just exactly repeated the message of, of, of the president and wrote, North Vietnamese petrol boats, PT, that's just a small military boat, attack US destroyer, that's just a big military boat. And if you look at the facts, then people in the 60s, 60s, who were in the flower power movement, they said, we don't want that, okay? We don't want these wars, stop these wars, end Vietnam War. These people are totally correct. 
Okay, so if there are any hippies in the room, you were right. The, <laughs> the other thing is, the other thing is that we really take a long, long time as historians to find out the truth. That's the problem for historians. We can't know on the day that it happens. We take 10 years, 20 years. But today, I can tell you, there was no attack on the Maddox in the Gulf of Tonkin. What really happened is the following. The Americans, Vietnam at the time was split between North and South Vietnam, okay, like Korea today. And the Americans supported South Vietnam, and in the North, uh, the North Vietnamese were under Ho Chi Minh. The French had withdrawn, it used to be a, col a French uh, uh, col colony. And then the CIA um, armed the South Vietnamese army. They made them stronger and stronger. And then they had these little boats, and then, then they went up the coast. This coast, this is the coast in Vietnam. And then the country was split, and the US was in the south. And they went up with the boats, and here on the coast of no North Vietnam, they attacked installations like radar installation, military depots. They just went, -da 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 -da, blew it all up, and back to the south. Do you understand? Up, brrr, back. And next day, up, brrr, back. That's the game. And they did that again and again and again. Now, that creates tension. <laughs> Very simple. Uh, yeah. It's like if you have a neighbor, and like you throw in his window, and then you say, oh, I didn't do anything. Next time, you blow up his car, and you say, oh, pff, I didn't do it. You know, I'm not saying you should do it. I'm, I'm say, what I'm trying to point out is that we, as human beings, are very good at creating tensions. There are no tensions, and you create tensions. We know how to do it. You break glass, put it on the street, people come with their bike, lots of tension, you know? So that's what the CIA did. They made raids, one raid after another on North Vietnam. And then on one day, they came with the Maddox, which is a US ship, and they went very close. And then they made raids at the same time. And then when the Vietnamese fired at the Maddox, they said, ah, Vietnam has attacked the United States. That's just fake. Because the Maddox was not hit. Nobody died, the Maddox didn't sink, but the war started. And you know, the, the moment when, when Johnson spoke on television was at 11 o'clock at night. Most people at that time are very tired or drunk, so they're like, oh, what's happening? And bang, the war starts. And then the people in Vietnam are getting killed. Three million people killed. And that's, to me, as a historian, just very, very sad. It's very, very sad. Why do we do it again and again? Although we know that is not right. I mean, we know we have the UN Charter and forbids invasion of another country, so the US should never bomb Vietnam, and Vietnam should never bomb the US. Clearly, you know, it goes for both sides. But then I go like, why were people so fooled? And it just is really the problem that they believe what they read in the media. That is the main problem. People watch television, they see something they think they understand. They read a newspaper, they read, the other one has attacked, and then it they start it. But everybody who has kids, you know, he knows you have to talk to both sides. Like I have a, a boy and a daughter, and when they fight, well, they don't fight anymore now, of course, they're grown up, but <laughs> when they were small and they were fighting, I asked the boy, and he said, yeah, this and this, that happened. Okay, and you hear a story, and then you ask the girl, and she said, yeah, before that and that happened. And then you get the full picture. But if you just listen to one story, you're fooled, always. So three million people killed in Vietnam, and it was all lies, all lies. Let's take Cambodia. Nixon drops bomb on Cambodia. He comes into power of, you know, Johnson doesn't go for president anymore, so Nixon becomes power, into power, and he says, I'm going to withdraw from Vietnam. I have a plan. That's his, that's his promise. And people vote for him. But his plan really is to destroy everything first and then go out. <laughs> so that was his plan. So, um, Cambodia here, you probably can't see it, but this is Vietnam. Oops. Here, and here's Cambodia. It's just next door. You're not allowed to bomb a country next door. You're not allowed. The UN Charter clearly says you can't do it. So, the, the check is always, is this after 45? Yes, it's after 45. Is it a country? Yes, it is a country. Then you're not allowed to attack. It's very simple. But Nixon told the Air Force, US Air Force, to talk about villages in Vietnam, okay? 
And then he made a conspiracy. People come to me and say, conspiracy? Is this something which happens? And I'm going to go like, yeah, sure, all the time. Do you think they called Fidel Castro and said, tomorrow we're going to make an invasion? Conspiracies in international politics is not the exception, it's the rule. Before they killed Caesar, they didn't tell him. <laughs> you lose the advantage of, of, of those who, who want to carry out something if they inform everybody, okay? So Nixon, in this very specific case, said, oh no, we're not bombing Cambodia, and he made a conspiracy. Chief generals within the Air Force were given the information that they're bombing Cambodia. And then they made a so-called dual reporting system. One group of officers only got the data of villages in Vietnam, and they thought they were bombing villages in Vietnam. And the other group, which was the small circle, got the real targets, and they were in Cambodia. So he made a total confusion in, this, in the US military to fool them that they were bombing another country. And if you see these things, and these are facts, I mean, you can check it for yourself. This is Nixon, Cambodia, dual reporting, you will find the facts. Then you see that whenever it comes to war, whenever it comes to terror, it's very important for us as citizens to think twice. You should never, ever trust a president. Never. Oh, yeah, just, yeah it's just a stupid idea to trust blindly television or, or, or newspapers. It's a very stupid idea. Cambodia. Let's do Afghanistan. Um, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in 1979. Leonid Brezhnev was in charge, so he's the pre-predecessor of um, Putin, if you want. And that, that is illegal. It is totally illegal, because in 1979, that clearly is after 45. And if it's after 45, the UN Charter applies. And the invasion um, crossed the border of a country. You know, there's no debate whether that's two countries. It clearly is two countries. But people tell me, well, the CIA was in Afghanistan and armed the Mujahideen already in summer 1979. And that's true. We know it now. They armed the Mujahideen before the invasion. But still, the invasion is illegal. You can't say, well, you know, they sort of triggered me. No, no, no. It's your responsibility whether you go in or not. And uh, uh, one million people killed. So it's very hard, it's hard stuff, you know. You look at it and you go like, why do we do it again and again? And it's just, we totally forgot about the UN Charter, and we believe war propaganda blindly, and then you have a lot of people killed. And the CIA then trained Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan against the Soviets. So the, the CIA they delivered a lot of Stinger missiles to the Mujahideen, and Stinger missiles is like a rocket you can carry around and shoot down a helicopter. They didn't have these in Afghanistan. But they sent them from the US. So when people ask me, is it possible you know, that there is a cooperation between the Secret Service and Osama bin Laden? I say, yes, in the 80s, that is the fact. That is the historical fact. The CIA armed Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan. That's the fact. And the Saudis flew with planes from Saudi Arabia and brought young radical Muslims to Afghanistan. That's it. And the idea in this operation is, and this is a, a pattern that you always have in, in secret warfare, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Do you see the pattern? There was no love between the CIA and radical Muslims. It was just they wanted the Soviets to bleed. Okay, you read it in the, in, the, in the data. Because they had just lost in Vietnam, so they wanted the Soviets to bleed. And the Soviets did bleed a lot. So Afghanistan is illegal. Now Kuwait is interesting. In 1990, and some in, in the room remember, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Again, 1990s after 45, though the UN Charter applies. Second thing, clearly two different countries. Now, Saddam Hussein immediately, immediately was condemned by the UN Security Council. Okay? And that's interesting. You go like, hey, gee, why is he condemned? And I would say, that's very easy to explain. He is no veto power. That's the only difference. He was condemned because Iraq is not a veto power. And that's the thing you should check. Before you invade a country, are you a veto power? <laughs> that's the only thing you have to check. If you're a veto power, no problem. You bomb another country. The Security Council is not going to condemn you. If you are not a veto power and you invade another country, the Security Council is going to sit together and say, the UN Charter says you cannot use force in international relations. Okay? 
That's the whole thing. So it was on the same day that they passed Resolution 660 and ordered Iraq to withdraw all troops. And that's how it should be, okay? That's one of the very, very few cases where you actually have data that shows you how it should be. But Iraq, under Saddam Hussein, if you recall the history of the Middle East, invaded Iran in 1980, okay? So it's not his first war, it's his second war of aggression. And at that time, he was protected by the West. They even gave him chemical weapons, which he used against the Kurds. But at that time, he was our guy. So he thought, I can do it again. You know, he said, I have powerful friends in Washington, and if I attack another country, they're going to be fine. And funny thing is, they, he, before he invaded the, uh, Kuwait, he even talked to April Glaspie. April Glaspie was US ambassador in Baghdad. And he said, you know, I got some problems with uh, Kuwait. And she said, whatever you do to settle your problems, it's yours. And some historians say that was a trick. Okay? She fooled him into invading Kuwait by signaling, you can do it. And then when he did it, back. You can't do it. So, you know, these are, these are tricky games. And the point is, as I signaled before, you have 193 countries in the world, but only five are veto powers. The others, 188, are not veto powers. So, sorry to say, the Netherlands is not a veto power. Switzerland is not a veto power. We're, we're, we're on a lower class here, okay? It's two classes. Upper class, veto power. Lower class, no veto power. And the stupid thing is that we read the press from the veto powers and think it's true. <laughs> That's really stupid. It's very stupid. Um, to, to actually stir up the emotions in the United States, a girl named Naira went into fr in front of Congress and with tears in her eyes said, while I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers coming into the hospital with guns and go into the room where 15 babies were in incubators. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators and left the babies on the cold floor to die. Now, she said that on, on October 10, 1990s. You have to remember the invasion was in August. And the Americans said, ah, oh, we don't want to go into this war. It's just about oil. So there was no, 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 no feeling for the war. And then they pushed that feeling. And I can just explain to you how you can push a feeling. It's just by spreading a story. Today we know this story is totally false. It never happened. But this girl said, I worked as a nurse in the hospital of Kuwait, and I saw with my own eyes that they killed babies. Now, if you tell a population that they kill babies, people go all crazy. They go, let's go to war. Where's that? Iraq, Iran, is that the same country? So, out of total confusion, with a story they don't understand, they have such a lot of emotions that they think it's the right thing to fight. Later, we find out the girl was, in fact, the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador in the US. And the story was produced by Hill and Knowlton, which is a public relations firm. So we really need to wake up and understand whenever there is a war, there is a lie. Okay? They always come hand in hand. And these lies are something we should look for. It's not that we should say, well, no, like, I don't think there's a lie if a war starts. It's probably, you know, serious information by serious presidents and serious journalists and serious TV stations. And I always say, yes, they're serious, but they want serious war, okay? It's not serious education of the public. Otherwise, people would go, you know, through the roof. If, if serious journalists had found out at the, at the moment that she was just telling a story, okay, then people would go like, why do we have all these lies? But people at the moment who were there, they, you know, they burst out into tears. And when at that point, as a historian, you go and say, can I, can I see you know, the details of, of her degrees as a nurse? And can I check, does she have photos when she was in the hospital? Then people will attack you, okay? They will attack you and say, you, you just have no heart. We want to make a war and you, you're against it? You're heartless, okay? <laughs> so this is Kuwait. Let's take Serbia. Do you see this is a long, long arrow? Serbia's here. And Clinton bombed Serbia in 99. That was a short, a short war. 78 days and 3,500 killed. That's not a lot. I mean, if you take the 3 million from uh, Vietnam, then you can say, okay, that was a small war. But what they did is they used depleted uranium. 
Depleted uranium is used to break, break through tanks. It's very cheap, but what you have is radioactive dust. So they have a lot of cancer now in Serbia. And what the US then did, they built Camp Bonsteel. That is a military installation. And I know there are some people who are really deep into international politics and history and others who don't, you know, are not into politics. And I always say it's very easy to understand power. You have to, say, to check who is building a military camp where. And then the question is, has Serbia built a military camp in the US? Or has the US built a military camp in Serbia? That's the question you have to ask. And then you look at the facts. And then when you realize, oh, it's the US who have bombed Serbia and built a military camp there, then we call it imperialism. That's imperialism. Because the Serbs were not, oh, thanks. That's great. Thanks for bombing us. Gee, you even built a military camp, camp in our country. Thanks for helping. This is not the attitude. No country wants this inva invasion. Yep. And Schröder said, I violated international law because the Germans bombed with, okay? They took part in the, in the bombing. And this is Serbia, and when we look at Afghanistan, you again see it's a very long distance. So Afghanistan war was triggered by 9-11, but I wanted to explain that when I look at war, at the war, I look at it completely different than people in the streets. I always go like, did they lie? What could be the lies? And the people in Afghanistan, they didn't know why they were killed. 200,000 people killed after 9-11, after okay? So the problem is when, when they sent Dutch soldiers and German soldiers and American soldiers to Afghanistan, people didn't check the facts first. And you can't do that, okay? You always have to check the facts first before you send your boys. You, can't, you, can, you cannot say, well, the TV has checked the facts. Or you cannot say, well, the US president has said, you know, that's not a good source. And what we then did is we looked at 9-11 and we saw that this was the cause for the war in Afghanistan. The story was Osama bin Laden is in Afghanistan. He is responsible for this terrorist attack. That's why we have to make war against Afghanistan. That was the story. And then the story was two planes hit two buildings and then they collapsed. So the reasons for the destruction of the buildings was the planes. And then when I looked at it, I found out that it's actually three buildings that collapsed and not two. And then I asked myself, why did that third building collapse? Was it hit by a plane? And the answer is no. Then I asked myself, why did it collapse? Out of, out of sympathy or why, why does, I mean, that is a really big question. It's a big question. These are the Twin Towers, and this is World Trade Center 7. And it, people who saw this in New York were shocked. It's like the story with the, with the girl and, and the babies. The shock was very, very profound. And this is the building. And this went down on, on, on the 11th of September 2001. And then what I did with the students in Switzerland, because I was teaching history, I gave them a 600 pages report which had been published in 2004. This was the official report on the terrorist attacks of September 11. The story, as you have it. And then I tell them, check why World Trade Center 7 fell. And the crazy thing is, World Trade Center 7 is mentioned in the official report, but not that it collapsed. So the official report is missing the collapse of a building. This is incredible. You cannot say, well, two or three, let's not be picky. <laughs> you know, this is the moment when you should wake up and say, what? Even three years later, they didn't get, get the buildings right? And then you have an interesting article in 2016 in the um, your physics journal. And it says, the building dropped in absolute free fall for the first 2.2 seconds. And that is very important. If a building goes into free fall, that's not normal day, okay? Buildings don't, don't go every day into free fall like that. It is a very, very special thing to go into free fall. And this is the building before, and this is after. So completely in its footprint. And then I compared this with the tallest building in Switzerland that we have. It's 178. 
and the World Trade Center is 186. I didn't check here for, for Holland, but in Switzerland, we don't have a building that high. We just don't have it. In New York, obviously, there's lots of buildings. But if such a building in Switzerland went into free fall, we would really, really re research this. We would not say, oh, it doesn't matter. It was a bad day. We, we would really research it. Architects, police, secret service, military, journalists, everybody, we would just research it. And what the question is, is not to, that it takes a lot of courage to research this. Do you see that? To research the question, what happened to World Trade Center 7, to my mind, takes more courage than to go down its waterfall. I mean, this is, this is a picture I saw, and I thought, oh, that, that's a crazy guy. He just goes down that waterfall. The point is, he doesn't want to kill himself, right? This is, this is a technique, a sport. You take a risk. But if people research 9-11, they also take a risk because they get attacks and everything. And I realized this because I uh, worked at the uh, Center for Security Studies at ETH in Zurich, and I talked to the experts, and they told me these are building uh, engineers, structural engineers, and they said, I think World Trade Center 7 has probably been brought down by controlled demolition. And what they told me is, sorry if I go back, they told me to watch these. These seconds, only these seconds. Now, the building didn't go up and down and up and down. <laughs> I just repeat that these, to me, are the crucial seconds when it comes to 9-11. To and they said, they, it can't go up it can't go down in a symmetrical way without, without controlled demolition. And then I said, well, we don't know whether there was any controlled demolition on that day. In fact, we're not even speaking about it. And they said, well, that's your problem. You're a historian. So, so really, the tough thing for historians today is to talk about contro controlled demolition when it comes to 9-11. And I tell you, we get a lot of criticism if we do it. We get a lot of criticism. It's not, it's not like, oh, thank you, that's very interesting. Let's all come together and get the best evidence. It's not like that. It's not like that. I published this in 2006 in a Swiss newspaper 13 years ago. And then the US Embassy in Switzerland intervened and said, what's all that nonsense? Okay. So pressure is being put on the experts who do the research to shut up. That's basically the situation. And I just want to show you that this is the building when it was constructed. It was, they started in 83, and it was destroyed in 2001. So the building, you know, it, it died as a teenager, if you want, you know. It didn't live very long, but it was a solid steel construction. And if a solid steel construction goes into free fall, then you need to remove the stability of the entire building at the same second, because you can't, you can't say here it is damaged, and this other side is in great sympathy, and whenever there is a damage here, it will also be damaged. You have to damage everything at the same second, okay? That's the thing. And so there's a group in the US called Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, and I think they do very, very good work. Richard Gage is, is there very active. And he says, we must have a new investigation. We must have a new investigation why the building fell down, also why the Twin Towers collapsed. And even in Japan, not sure whether you have surfed the internet a lot recently, if you read a little bit of Japanese, this is, this is a Japanese um, parliamentarian, and he brought into the Japanese parliament in 2008 a picture of World Trade Center 7. So we're here now in the Netherlands. I'm from Switzerland, but the debate is also in the US and it is in Japan. So people who are interested in international politics, who are interested in peace, who are interested in, in how the media works or who are interested in war and terrorism, they, they see this, okay? They go, oh, that's interesting. I want to know more. And then the National Institute for Standards and Technology, which in the United States is responsible for the analysis of this collapse, published a report. But it's important to understand that the NIS is part of the Department of Commerce. So it's part of the Bush administration. So the NIST in 2008 said a fire has caused the collapse of the building. And that's where I will leave it with you, okay? It's either fire or controlled demolition. And you just have to think for yourself. And you have to talk with your friends. What do you think? Did fire or controlled demolition destroy World Trade Center 7? Most people say, World Trade Center, what? I don't even know the building. But if you, if you have friends who are well-informed, they, they might be able to, to discuss with you this issue. 
Within the NIST, very interesting, you have a person who is called Peter Michael Ketchum. He didn't do the research on World Trade Center 7, but he read the report and he says, there's something very wrong with this report. He said, a few months ago, that was in 2017, I began to read some of the NIST reports. Quickly, I became furious, first about myself. How could I have worked at NIST and not noticed this before? Second, I was furious with NIST. Don't know what it is, but in the investigation, World Trade Center 7, something went totally wrong. Nothing ends up. The truth is where our healing lies. And that's very wise. He says, we must find the truth about the collapse of World Trade Center 7. And he says, the truth will help us. Because as long as we're, we're stuck in reports that are not the truth, we will, we will not come to any healing. So the choice really is, if you talk about NIST, do you trust Shyam Sander or Ketchum, Michael Ketchum? And my feeling from the data that I've looked at is Ketchum is a very, very serious, a very solid mathematician. And I'm not convinced by the work of Sander, I have to say. I'm not convinced. Because Sander has said, oh, the building fell due to fire. But Leroy Halsey, who's one of the leading experts in the United States on the subject, says fire cannot have destroyed the building. So you're in this debate with all these experts saying this and saying that. In the end, you have to make up your own mind. Okay? I show you that seven, building seven destroy, uh, fell in free fall for more than two seconds. That's a fact. It was not hit by a plane. That's a fact. The NIST said column 79 was destroyed by fire, and that's why the whole building collapsed. But the architects in Switzerland, and I talked to them, say, well, we have 81 solid columns, and if one is destroyed, you still have the other 80 columns. And that's not something I can solve for you. That's something for everybody to solve. But it is the reason for the Dutch army being in Afghanistan. And that's the moment when people have to reflect and say, don't we have generals in the army who can check the data? Don't we have parliamentarians, the people I vote for, who can check the data? Don't we have people in the newspaper who can check the data? Is everybody asleep? What's going on? And then I read the New York Times in 2008 when the NIST published its report. And the New York Times says these beams, they got hot because of the fire. And these beams pushed on this girder. And then the girder let loose here on column 79. And then this column buckled. That's the story. When I checked that story with my structural engineers, they said, yeah, if you have fire under a beam, it expands. But the important point is it expands in every way. So it doesn't expand only here, but also here. The beam has no intelligence to know that it should push towards column 79. Okay, it doesn't have that intelligence, it just expands. And it doesn't expand towards the core of the center where we feel a lot of, of, of a lot of mass in the building, whereas outside there's just air, there's zero resistance. So it tends to expand towards the air. But the NIST said it expands towards the center. First problem, that's not science. That's science fiction. Second problem is, even if we assume it expands towards the center, then it has to push the girder here of the column. Take an original picture. To get it off the column, that's the building as it really is, you have to get the bolts out. Okay? The, 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 the girder is not just like here. They didn't fix it. They just put it on top of it. And if something pushes, it falls off. No, no. It's on there. It's fixed okay, with bolts. So you have to push them away. That takes a lot of strength. And even if you say, OK, OK, it was very hard, and it pushed it all away, and it just pushed inside, then you only have one column, which is column 79, which buckles. And if you have only one column, you can't have free fall of the entire building. So that's for you to figure out. Um, and then I, I checked that people are so hypnotized by the media. And I checked, where did they inform about this whole situation? And they informed on BBC. And BBC reported, you know, many television channels only report about the collapse of one building and then the second, and not the third. You know, many people still today, in 2019, think... I mean, here in Amsterdam, you go outside, you ask somebody how many 
buildings collapsed in 2001, they say two. Many people say two. That's wrong. That's the wrong answer. They have no clue. If they say three, then that's interesting. And the third building was not hit by a plane. So I checked who informed the world about it. And BBC informed and said, okay, the third building collapsed. But and that's a problem. They informed too early. <laughs> it's really bad because they informed at 5 o'clock in the 5 o'clock news, but the building collapsed at 5.20. And that's not good. That's not good at all. <laughs> yeah, for you it's funny. For me it's always very difficult. We as historians, we have to write history. Should we write the buildings were brought down with uh, controlled demolition? Or should we write the building collapsed because of the planes, although one was not hit by a plane? I mean, what are your kids going to read? So the BBC reported this, and then later she said it was a mistake. And it's not, she's not to blame, okay? She's not to blame. She was just given a text, and she read it out. She didn't do the research. And her boss, Richard Porter, said, we have this statement from Reuters. But the Reuters is one of the biggest news agencies of the world. And they got it wrong, and it's the biggest terrorist attack. So this is really the moment when people should think about media. How does media work? What is right? What is wrong? And I always argue that you should check. You should check everything. If you don't have the time to check, then just say, I don't want any wars. You can work in your garden, check nothing. Somebody comes, have you heard this and that? We must bomb that or that country. You're just planting your roses and you say, no, we shouldn't bomb anybody. I'm against it. UN Charter forbids wars. You don't need to check anything. You can just stay there. But if you're interested in all the details, then check. So there's architects and engineers. They drive around in the United States. <laughs> Did you know a third tower fell on 9-11? And people who see this, I mean, they're totally surprised because they don't know. And why do they drive around with the car? Because you don't hear it on television. You don't hear it. Here it says, Building 7 not hit by a plane collapsed in free fall seven hours after the Twin Towers did. And there's a picture before and after. That's San Diego, 2013. So really, we're here at the end a little bit. Bush also invaded Iraq. That was illegal. We have reasons to believe Saddam Hussein is building nuclear weapons. That's just lies. And Colin Powell showing this. Ah, oh, this is... The proof, this is just lies. And the British press then linked up Saddam Hussein with Osama bin Laden, if you've maybe seen that. If you research propaganda, it's very interesting to see that The Sun, which is a very, very bad newspaper, how they did it. They just write, the proof we needed, Saddam does back bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and poses a direct threat to Britain. That's just nonsense. But if people read it, they have it in their head. And then they believe it. Even if it's totally non-true. You know Goebbels, who was the propaganda minister of Hitler? He said, it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. You just have to repeat it a thousand times. People will believe it. So you, 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 you tell people that, you know, Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden worked together. They go like, oh, yeah, oh, I think so. No, they didn't. <laughs> and then they bomb Iraq because they believe Saddam Hussein is to blame for 9-11. And they don't even know that three buildings collapsed. So they go into a war. They shoot somebody even torture in Abu Ghraib, but they have no clue. No clue. Total ignorance. Colin Powell later said that, you know, he's, 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 he's sorry. He said he's sorry, which is, I think it's good to say sorry. It's a good idea to say sorry, but it would be better not to lie. And the Iraq is one million dead. So these things are not small, okay? These are not small. One million people killed in Iraq. ABC weapons of mass destruction, not true. And the soldiers painted the Pentagon and the Twin Towers on their helmet and asked in 2006, some 85% of US soldiers said their main mission was to punish Saddam for his role in 9-11 attacks. So what we have is brainwash. It is brainwash. There is no role of Saddam in 9-11, nothing. And these soldiers, they shoot others and others shoot them. So it's just the young guys having no clue having no clue, shooting each other. And if we are the grown-ups, we should at least, you know, check the facts. We should check the facts and say, until we know the facts, no wars. <laughs> that will mean the end to war, because we will never know all the facts. And that is actually the reason why I came here, and I think also why George is here. I mean, I think the President Bush should get a red card for, for this behavior. I mean, I'm, I watch a lot of football, and in football, if you, if you make a foul, you get a red card. 
And that's how we should have it in international politics. You shouldn't invade other countries and you know, still be greeted everywhere. You should get a red card. And my conclusion is that really we shouldn't just believe all the stories that they tell us. That's really my conclusion. We get a lot of stories every day. And, and we should then try to think for ourselves. I have, I've, I've done this training that I go a lot into the woods. And obviously here you can walk along the sea or other, other areas where you don't have any media. Okay? You should go somewhere where you have no television, no smartphone, no tablet, no newspaper, no nothing. And then you can balance your mind. Because the problem is with people that are always in front of the media, they're completely brainwashed. You even tell them they're brainwashed, they, they get very angry. They're not like, oh, thanks. You think there are lies? You're, yeah, there are a lot of lies, ABC weapons, Iraq, have you realized? Ah, oh, yeah, do you really think? But no, they, they want to stay there. And it's very hard to get somebody out of this brainwashed state. And one good trick is to actually go for walks, long walks in nature. It can reset your, your balance. It can really reset your balance. <laughs> That's uh, another <laughs> suggestion. Uh, and what I also do is this training in mindfulness. I mean, I watch my own thoughts, and I realize that I'm not my thoughts, but that I'm the consciousness within which thoughts arise. And that's a total difference. I mean, if you watch your own thoughts, then you see, oh, I'm thinking that. Oh, I'm thinking this. I'm thinking many things, right? Actually, I'm thinking the whole day. It's like a, a torrent of water coming down a waterfall. All the time you're thinking stuff. And the, the, the big trick, if, you, if, you're, if you're interested in the peace movement, the big trick is don't believe all the things that you think. That's the trick. That really relaxes you a lot because people think about themselves, I'm not worth it that I'm here, or I'm too stupid, I can't understand things, or um, nobody loves me. They think a lot of things which is just basically not true. <laughs> and so we should stop thinking all these things that, that, that hurt us. And war propaganda puts thoughts in our mind which, which confuses a lot. And that's the idea of a thought to, to confuse you if it's war propaganda. So what I did is I focused on symmetry in nature. I gave my mind the task. I said, now, Dan, you search for symmetry in nature because my mind is always focusing on this and that, and I really have to tell him, now you do something else. And then when I'm a lit little bit sad, after you've researched a lot of wars and crimes, you're a bit sad, then you can cheer up by focusing on symmetry in nature because there's a lot of symmetry in nature. I mean, snowflakes, not right now in summer, but um, if you look at flowers and you really look at it, like not just, oh yeah, I've seen it, but like try to look at it five minutes. And you see the symmetry, it's incredible. And all the wars, uh, wars in the world have never destroyed that symmetry. So you have this very strong and wonderful feeling that a lot of things are total in order. Total in order. But you have to focus on it. And that's what we have to learn. We have to focus on something and say, Okay, World Trade Center 7, give me everything. And then you put 10 or 20 or 50 hours into it. And then you say, symmetry in nature. I want to see it every day, half an hour, I want to see it. And that is possible. But we get so distracted that many people can't even read 100 pages. They go beep, 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 beep everywhere. But nothing with, with dedication. So that, that's what I, what, what I advise people to do. What I did, I, I, I showered for one year just cold showers just to see um, how my mind goes crazy. It's funny, it's really funny. It goes, oh no, you can't take a cold shower, it's really on, it's not nice and stuff, and it just talks. I'm, I'm not sure whether it's the same with you, but your mind talks all the time. You wake up in the morning, the mind talks. It's already done. Have you, have you sent that email? You should go shopping, or you're still in bed. Oh, well, how about the kids? I mean, is this done? And this talking mind, yeah, is taking over. It's just taking over. And when you take a shower, a very cold shower, then it makes a lot of noise. And then you can observe it. It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, you observe your mind. It's very interesting. It's always with you until you die. You might as well observe it, because that's the point where war propaganda comes in. And uh, once you've showered uh, cold for a year, it's not that easy anymore with the mind. You watch your mind. Yeah, that's, um, that's what I wanted to tell you, and I thank you very much for your intention.